Now we'll talk about a few things to update you. There are so many topics, but I hope these are interesting. Dupuytron's disease, surgical infection after steroid injections, latest gadgets, flexor tendon repair, and wrist arthritis. Now let's look at Dupuytron's disease. Some of these principles are applied to orthopedics in general. And so I hope you'll find this is a really useful way of just catching up on many different principles. Now, Dupuytron's disease is heterogeneous, which means there's lots of different types of diseases, which means there's lots of different types of treatment, which means in a way that we have to look at the science that we learn in our training, in our journals, our books, but apply that like an artist onto the patient in front of us. Some nodules, these tree stumps, if you like, are best left well alone. Some cords, logs, if you like, are more suitable to surgery particularly those people with a diathesis or big dense cords. Others are more suitable, like twigs, for needle fasciotomy. Now these are all Honda bikes. And when we see a patient with Jupitrons, in a way we choose the right bike for the right terrain, the right tool for that particular patient in front of us. This looks complicated, but it's not. And when you look at anything in surgery, anything in life for that matter, risk is not just risk, it's that risk is the chance of something happening, but also the consequence if it does happen. So for example, if you look at Dupuytrons, something that's extremely rare, but a disaster, say amputation, is in fact only medium risk. Because although it's a disaster, it happens so infrequently. Whereas something that's really quite common, but severe, let's say recurrence, is actually high risk because it's not good if it happens, it's much more difficult treatment and it happens quite frequently. So remember anything in medicine, anything in life, if it's a risk, is the chance of it happening but also the consequence if it were to happen. Now I'm sure you've all heard of the Montgomery versus Lancashire ruling by the Supreme Court. And this is very important with everybody that we treat. A doctor has a duty to take reasonable care to ensure a patient is aware of any material risk. And the test of materiality is whether the reasonable patient thinks this is important. It doesn't matter what we think, it's what the patients think. Let's look at return to work. Now, if you just offer somebody surgery and it takes six to eight weeks to recover, but in fact, that patient could have had a simple needle fasciotomy and be back to work two days later. Well, you are liable for that patient's lost wages if you didn't give them the option to fully understand that there might have been a much, much quicker treatment that would get them back to work. So we must always look at the patient's perspective and what the patient would reasonably expect to know before they come to a decision. It's not for us to decide for them. Another thing with Jupitrons is this. We're not really using enough needles. Needles means less surgery, less complications, lower cost. And this led to this paper which came out, uh, it's online now if you want to read it, but using more needles across the world. If you think about it in surgery, uh, cardiac surgery and gynecology, everybody is becoming less and less invasive. And we're the same in orthopedics with arthroscopes, percutaneous fixation, and so on. Now, another thing we need to remember as orthopedic surgeons is that we have custodianship of limited healthcare resources. Every operation we do is spending money that could be spent on something more painful, more disabling, more sinister. And every operation we do carries a risk of a costly complication. And if there are two options, then we really ought to be giving proper consideration to the cheapest, the safest and the quickest recovery. We really shouldn't be spending healthcare money on some little painless bent finger with Jupitrons when we've got people on our waiting list with painful, painful conditions, desperate for, say, a hip replacement or a joint replacement in the hand. We did have other needles. Zeopex was very popular, but it's unfortunately been withdrawn. Now, another thing for orthopedics is that every surgeon has their own Venn diagram. 
A Venn diagram is when things overlap. So say in Jupitrons, you've got needle fasciotomy, dermofasciectomy, and limited fasciectomy. And every surgeon has their own preferred proportion of how they use these treatments. So on the left here is the Venn diagram for a surgeon who prefers limited fasciectomy and is very cautious about needles, very cautious about skin grafting. On the right happens to be my Venn diagram. I try and do as many needles as I can because it's cheap and it's safe and it's quick and it's effective, but it does come back. And I do quite a lot of skin grafting as well because when you get used to it, it's just as easy as limited fasciectomy, but it's much less likely to come back. So why do an operation if there's a chance of it coming back? If you're going to do big surgery, let's do it properly. So we all have our own Venn diagrams, and it's important that we learn and we understand what we're good at. So when we discuss with the patient, according to Montgomery, what they might want, we do have to match it with our skill set. Now, another aspect is outcome measures. Outcome measures can be objective, which is what we say, for example, the angle of two patrons, or subjective, which is much more relevant, patient-related outcome measures. And there's without doubt been a paradigm shift towards PROMS, patient-related outcome measures. It's kind of pretty obsolete now to judge what we do by what we think. So PROMS in Dupatrons could be generic, like EQ5D, pretty useless for us. Why? Well, you know, how do you feel this morning? It doesn't really, a bent finger doesn't make you feel too bad. It's not sensitive enough. There are upper limb specific scores like DASH and Quick DASH. These are okay, but they have fields like tingling or pain. Well, tube trans doesn't tingle, not painful, doesn't stop you sleeping. These aren't sensitive to change. There are hand specific scores like the Michigan or the PEM. Well, they're not bad, but they still don't really pick up things precisely for Jupitrons. And finally, there are condition specific scores like the URAM, which is a, uh, a rheumatological score just for Jupitrons or the Southampton scoring scheme. And these schemes, when you measure them, are much more sensitive to change because they only measure this one condition. And across orthopedics, there are examples of scores we now use, which are just for one particular condition, one particular joint. There is another quick update. Do steroid injections increase the risk of surgical infection? Well, we do know that steroid injections are good medicine. Why? Because it's cheap, it's quick, it's effective. We know they work for carpal tunnel, trigger finger, basal thumb arthritis, if not durably for a worthwhile period. They can confirm the diagnosis. But do they increase the risk of infection? Well, actually, all of these papers are 2020, 2021, and it's pretty clear that if you have an injection for trigger finger, carpal tunnel, then within the first three months after that injection, if you have surgery, there is a higher risk of getting an infection, worth remembering. Now this is more fun, the latest gadgets. Orthopedic surgeons, we love all our stuff. Let's just look at a few hand surgery gadgets. And we'll go through these one by one. Now the total DRUJ replacement reliably addresses an unmet need, which is the unstable, painful DRUJ. Before this came along, we had no option for this particular condition. It's very, very clever. There's a polythene ball. There's a stem here that goes up and down as you rotate the forearm. There's a long, long stem that also integrates. And then the uh, DRUJ uh, in a stable fashion is reproduced by this plate. And this, this was brought into practice many years ago now, but as time's passing, we're starting to get more and more confident with results coming out. In this review in 2017, a 97% survival rate over four years, which isn't bad. I found this to be very successful. Here's a patient who had a wrist fusion, but an unstable sovacopandry, dreadful operation. We tried to stabilize it with this implant and this implant, and it still didn't work. And after nine operations, this lady was eventually pain-free uh, with a shaker. Transformed this lady's life. Here's another example. This patient had null the head replacement, which over the years eroded, and became painful. We took it out, and this was just three weeks ago, put in a shaker, uh, and this lady has a very, very painful, uh, a painless and stable rotating joint. 
Scaphoid plates. This is a great gadget. Now, traditionally, we've always used screws and sometimes wires to fix the scaphoid. But we now have this very, very low profile, but very strong plate. And this is clever because it allows us to fix fractures that previously were causing trouble. In particular, if you'd had a previous big screw and it didn't unite, and there's a big hole where it hasn't united, another big hole where the screw was. Now, you can't really fix this with another screw. There's no room. There'll be no biology. The cross-sectional uh, measurement, pi r squared, means that the more metal you put in, the less bone there is available to actually heal. And the scaphoid plate has been really useful for this sort of awkward fracture because the plate goes in at 90 degrees to the previous fixation, takes up almost no bone biology and allows plenty and plenty and plenty of bone graft to go where the screw was and across here. And these papers in 2019, well, they show that with a scaphoid plate and simple cancellous bio, uh, bone graft, 100% union rate, even with avascular necrosis. Uh, and, and this really is a very stable and very effective device. The only problem we have is that when you bend the wrist around, this plate can rub against the radius, and that's not ideal. So recent meta-analysis, 2021, showing again 94% union. Another one, uh, 2021, again, showing uh, very, very satisfactory results from this device. Another gadget you need to be aware of is the Vola lip plate. Now, this is the Vola lip. If you look at a scaphoid fracture, sometimes a bit pulls off the front, and it's very, very hard to capture that with a uh, traditional Vola plate because it's just too far distal. So we now do have available these various implants, which have got the Vola lip. This is it here, right at the front, to really go distal, really go distal. You can even put sutures in to actually hold that, that plate very, very distally and support it. And these really have made very difficult fractures much, much easier to fix. The Vola lip plate. Here's another one, the mini tightrope anchor. From time to time, if you do a trapeziectomy, the metacarpal base knocks down onto the scaphoid. That was really difficult to treat. And this device here, uh, very clever, it allows us to actually suspend out the metacarpal base using an anchor running from the base of the first to the base of the second. It's very effective in short-term use. What we don't know yet is whether it lasts. So watch this space. Bridge plating. This is an alternative to ex -fix external fixation. When I was much younger, we used to have to put in external fixators, pulling it apart. These are shocking. You imagine trying to live for six, eight, ten weeks with a slowly uniting fracture with these bits of metal sticking out your arm. So these exploded fractures, like you've trodden on a biscuit. Now you can't fix these with plates and wires and screws. But what you can do is, through two small incisions, put in a plate uh, here, goes all the way under, and we fix it proximally as well. And this jacks out the bone to length. Here's the big example we had of a highly comminuted fracture fixed with this bridge plate. CT scans showed it healed and eventually we took out the bridge plate. And finally for the gadget section, well, joint replacement for CMC joint arthritis. Now the gold standard for a long time has been simple trapeziectomy. It works well, but 85% of people are pleased. But joint replacement has the potential advantage that you can get back to pinch much, much quicker because you haven't shortened the ray. You don't need to adapt. So joint replacements are certainly appealing. There have been lots of different devices, lots of different materials, cemented or uncemented. But there's a very complex mechanics in the base of the thumb. And typical of orthopedics, typical. There's lots of series, they're small, they're from one keen center, short follow-up, lots and lots of designs have quietly faded away without publication to say they were bad, even though there may have been publications with very short follow-up saying they were good. And we have this Scott's parabola that I'm sure you're familiar with, with so many orthopedic devices where it starts off as a promising idea, everyone starts to use it, we all realize they're rubbish and we stop using them again. And thumb-based replacement is just the same. 
But watch this space. There are three implants at least, which are having some good 10 year results now. The Arpe, the Maya and the Ivory. It may be that with certain patients, uh, properly trained surgeons, we have just a few surgeons doing lots of them. Not everybody doing it. This is girfed, getting it right first time. But perhaps we should start to be using these for some specific people. Now, flexor tendon repairs. There are two recent review articles that you really should be aware of in the Journal of Hand Surgery on flexor tendon repair, how to get the best possible results. And to summarize, we should be using four or six strand sutures. The peripheral suture is optional. The repairs need to be bulked up, not gappy. We need to vent the pulleys. We need to get the splint going very, very quickly, not, not restrictive stiff splints. So we should use multi strands, preferably six strands, but if not four, using a smooth suture like proline. So when you do these fancy uh, knots here, you can pull it up together and get the ends together. Because what you want is a bunched up repair. If you do a smooth repair, then as the patient loads it, it starts to gap. Then there's no biology to heal. What you do is a bunched up repair. And if you do that, as the patient gets moving actively, it slightly flattens, but there's no gap. Now, I was always taught that you must never release the A4 pulley, never release the A2 pulley. Now, this is just not true. Actually, if you release the A2 or the A4 in order to get the tendon sliding in the pulleys, you won't bowstring. And anyway, there's no point doing a repair of a tendon if it can't move because it's jammed inside a pulley. And finally, wrist arthritis. We'll talk about neurectomy, preserving cartilage and wrist replacements or fusions. Now, neurectomy, you, you ought to remember this. It's been known for a long, long time that nerves crossing a joint innovate that joint. And Wilhelm, um, uh, nearly 80 years ago, described denervating the wrist with various incisions. There's a busy slide. It's meant to be. But basically, there are systematic reviews from 2020, three of them, actually showing that neurectomy gives good results, simply cutting the nerves to the wrist. Longer term outcomes, there are papers again, 2021. It does seem to work, but it probably does start to wear off for many people. And interestingly, it does not affect proprioception. So although you're cutting the nerves to the wrist, you still seem to know where the wrist is in space, which is odd. Preserving the cartilage. Well, look, it, surely it's better to use your own cartilage and subchondral bone than a bit of plastic and a bit of metal. It must be. And the thing in wrist surgery is if we can find with an arthroscopy or an X-ray or a CT arthrogram or a high quality MR that there's still cartilage theft, then by and large, we can do some sort of operation, a four corner fusion or a radial lunate fusion or a radial scaphal lunate fusion, proximal row carpectomy, where we keep as much cartilage as we can and only fuse out the bits that we don't need. That saves you having to have some... Uh, wrist replacement or something. And a four corner fusion, proximal carpectomy, they, they got equivalent results to each other. And it's best to go for a PRC if you can, if the mid carpal is preserved. Why? Well, because they've got good outcomes, but it's a safer operation. What about wrist replacement or wrist fusion? Horses for courses, how do you choose which one? Well, here's a systematic review from 2018. And really the pain and function and grip improvements are the same whether you replace or fuse. Wrist fusion is, is cheaper, it's gonna last longer, and it is a bit more predictable. About 20% of wrist replacements with modern designs seem to fail pretty soon. And this review article that we did quite a while ago now, but if you can't use the patient's own cartilage, then you can for wrist replacement for low demand people and a wrist fusion for high demand people. Now we always thought wrist fusion was simple, fire and forget, the pain's gone, strong wrist back to work. Well, is that true? Well, sort of, grip's not bad, pain's better, but two thirds of people still have pain and not everybody's very satisfied and almost everyone wishes they'd have their movement back going back to this partial wrist fusion and even thinking about wrist replacement. 
But risk replacement is not really that straightforward. Huge complication rate. This is a very honest paper here. 59% complication within two and a half years. This review, a while ago now, showing all these papers with short follow-up. Now those ones you're looking at there, four of the five have been withdrawn. With short follow-up, you know, you can't put in a hip or a knee now with short follow-up small series. You know, at the moment with risk, we've got no NJR, no beyond compliance. We need to be doing better. There's a new kid on the block, the MoTeC um, here. It's very easy to do. Uh, and the results are pretty encouraging. We'll just have to see how.